And we're off with episode 127 of the Athletes Podcast featuring Michaela Grant Mentis, also known as Bucky. Jordan Maslin, producer for the Athletes Podcast. Thanks for coming on, chatting as Always. we're doing these intro <laughs> sections now. Talk five, seven, eight minutes regarding world of sports, what's happening. Fun facts in life. Yeah, all like, that stuff. Uh, anything. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Speaking of that, we we're discussing we both got s- Top Gun. Tom Cruise. Top Gun Maverick. How'd you like it? Great flick. Yeah. Great flick. Um, I think they did a phenomenal job of making it. I don't know what the correct word is, but just set in the right time. Yes. And it was filmed in a way that was done appropriate to the last one and made them tie together well. Yeah, they did a fantastic job with it. Um, I think that obviously, like without being like super technical about it, like the story of this one was a lot better of the of of their mission and what they had to do compared to the last one. But there's something like... I don't know, maybe just because, like, I, you know, my dad, he loved that movie, so we saw it at least 10 times in, in my life. I was a bit nervous that they weren't, I wasn't going to get the same feeling I got for that movie or that they were going to try too hard to kind of have it stick to that to that old 80, 1986 film. But like you said, they did a fantastic job with it. Love the film. And you know what? Um, I think it even got better ratings than than the 1986 uh, version. It got like an 8.6 out of 10 on IMDb and like 90% or something on Rotten Tomatoes. So it did a, it's doing a fantastic job. That makes sense. It was a good movie. I, you know, I want to know another good movie. i not normally a movie person, but also I know. <laughs> watched Hustle or Half of Hustle last night. Great flick. Adam Sandler based around the 76ers. He's a scout. Phenomenal movie. Just launched yesterday on Netflix. Highly recommend. Check that out. I will. Love to hear what people's favorite between hustle, was it is it Maverick. is it like a comedy movie? No. Okay. No, no, it's straight up like scouting players, bringing them across, without 76ers approval, like and trying to get this kid through the draft. Like really cool story, inspire inspiring to say definitely got to watch it. Um, what else has happened this weekend? Yo, Canadian Open, St. George's, Hamilton, Ontario. Yeah, you got to be looking forward to that, eh? Saturday, I think I think we're gonna go try and make some content. You know? Yeah, talk for sure. Some, Talk to some athletes, you know, get their take, how the grand's feeling. You know, I, I, just a cool experience whenever you have something nearby that's a big event that you can go to. Yeah, attend. that's true. You know, have obviously. you ever been to a like a live golf event before? I have. Uh, down in Shaughnessy for the Canadian Open in Vancouver, like almost a decade ago, I guess. Oh, my God. I was going to say, like, so when you go, how do you do it? Do you stick out a hole or do you follow a golfer around? Is it kind of up to you? Yeah, it's totally up to you. You just get like a grounds pass and you can okay. go wherever. The okay. nice part about this is that we also get access to Maroon 5. That's the concert Saturday night. So you get a good bang for your buck. You know, you get both things involved. And But yeah, like I, I would typically probably follow a couple golfers, stay at one particular hole if it's playing hard. Yeah. If there's a good opportunity to chat with guys, maybe see a spot there. But a couple of different options. I know I got a buddy on the 10th hole waiting with a beer there. So Oh, there you go. That's yeah, perfect. Could be worse. What else happened? Colorado makes it to the finals. Just breezed by the Edmonton Oilers. Yeah, you and I were watching game four. We're like, oh, you know what? Like, looks like we're going to see game five. Edmonton Oilers for the first half of that game was doing phenomenal. And then you got Kale McCarr, Nathan McKinnon, Landis Gog, all those guys step up, do their jobs, and take the win in OT. Like, the Colorado Avalanche are a wickedly good team. It, they're, they're scary good. They're doing it with their backup. They've got guys injured, and they're just handling teams. Fun fact, did you read or see the Instagram post that said this will be the first time, I believe, since 1979 that a teammate of Yamir Yager's will not be playing in the Stanley Cup Finals? Wow. <laughs> yeah. He's a he's a, a living legend, legitimately, like, in every sense of the term. Yeah. Like he, and he's still playing over in Russia. Like He's literally part owner, coach. He wears a... a phenomenal amount of hats on yeah. that <laughs> roster i don't know what he is able to do um yeah and i'm pretty sure time but and in the post like the picture he had obviously is one of the old ones but he was rocking the jofa helmet i know that we discussed that in this podcast i love this bucket story it's awesome i think that's such a cool little tie-in that we were able to enjoy hear from michaela herself pretty incredible yeah. individual to have on the show leading point scorer in merrimack college history Largest contract in professional women's hockey history. Yep. She's paving the way for more women in the sport of hockey. And I think she's doing it in a 
phenomenal fashion. Like she's gone here, been able to overcome every obstacle that seems to be thrown her way, getting overlooked by every organization possible and still comes in, plays two years with the six, dominates, comes into her third year and solidifies an incredible contract, 10% bonus. It's a, a good time to be Michaela Grant Mentis. Oh, for sure. During that podcast, I know that you guys are discussing things like her uh, going on the Society of Equity and Sport, where she's going to discuss her life in hockey with some amazing people on that panel as well. Uh, I really like you know, how she's very close with her family, too. It seems like she's grew up side by side with her brother playing hockey. Mm-hmm. And the challenges that must have went on in, in her life as a female playing double A hockey with all males. It's a fantastic part of the episode. She goes into depth about it. It's really cool to hear. And then um, very inspiring when you and her discussed playing for Team Canada and how you, you know, she wasn't the best player at 16 to 17 years old, maybe being overlooked. Even if in your younger stage, you might not be the best. It doesn't mean it's going to stay that way. It doesn't mean that you're always going to be where you are. If you keep putting in the work, keep trying like in her case, you could just be one of the best athletes in your sport. Development isn't <laughs> linear. Success isn't linear. Uh, it does sound like we might need to get her dad on the podcast as well know, right? based on his <laughs> accolades. But today's episode, number 127, features Michaela Grant Mentis. Thank you, folks, for tuning in to the Athletes Podcast. Please be sure to subscribe, comment, leave us your take. We'd love to hear it. Here we go. Cheers. Cheers. Congrats to you guys. Thank you. Well, congratulations <laughs> to you. This is a big contract celebration. That's Thank what we're you. doing here. Uh, but let's like let's dive into this because this is crazy to first of all have you in here sharing your story. I think a pretty phenomenal story that it is growing up in Brampton and now officially signing an eighty thousand dollar contract to play the sport of hockey for the <laughs> Buffalo Buttes next yep. season in the P hf the premier hockey federation newly named could you maybe just start by giving a bit of background on who you are how you've come to be this incredible hockey player and now are, is setting records and just doing tremendous things within the sport yeah so my name's michaela um i lived in brampton like you said my entire life i pretty much grew up playing with my twin brother so i played boys hockey for most of my life and then switched over to girls like second year of hitting in guys um, mainly just because my brother would get too much penalties oh. protecting me. So my mom was not a fan. Um, so yeah, then I switched to girls hockey and I wasn't the best back then, but over time I got better and played with some pretty good players and managed to make it up to college. Uh, then from college, I don't know how, but managed to make it to pro hockey and here I am. I feel like you're being a little humble. I am. <laughs> okay, okay, so we're gonna break we're gonna break down some of those barriers that you've got up <laughs> right now and dive deeper into how you were able to do that. I feel like let's start off maybe by talking about your brother, parents, what kind of influence they had on you, how you were able to maybe overcome some of the chirping that you received <laughs> on ice with having your brother's support there. What was it like growing up with a twin brother? I'm sure it added a little competition. Yes, it was legit a competition every single day for both of us it was I had to be better than him but he was always better than me Mm. so it's like I had to try 10 times harder than him um and I would always put in like more work than him which I hated because why would he have to be so good and I was terrible at that time um so like I'd work out extra with my dad like go on the ice more and he would just be like playing video games or something and still manage to score like 60 goals in a season so it's like okay I don't get it but then um it was good you know he he protects me a lot anytime anybody just touched me like even if they touched me just on the shoulder like he would go crazy um there was one time where like my whole team it was like literally a bench brawl against this one kid because he hit me from behind and they had to end the game because we had no players to play with like there was literally 10 of our guys in the box and there was just like me and two other guys on the bench wow so the game just ended because like who there was no one to play yeah were you okay? Um, oh, yeah. No, it was perfectly fine. I got okay. right back up, but they didn't like that. No. Um, and then, yeah, they just, from there, I just kept pushing and pushing. And then switching to girls hockey was a little bit easier than boys. Mm-hmm. So my dad basically made me, like, continue all the stuff I was doing in boys hockey to further my career. But it did me well. 
now. <laughs> I'd say so. You're doing all right. Yeah. All time top score in Merrimack College history at yeah. 120, 117 points. Sorry. Uh, one of the fastest growing educational institutions in the country. Your dad also played for Team Canada, representing them for ball hockey. What was that influence like having someone with that knowledge, experience, skill set alongside your brother there to compete with? Yeah. Like, that seems like a pretty good combination. Oh, yeah. My dad, he's a, a man of little words. He doesn't say much. Um, but, you know, when he's like upset and, you know, when he's proud of you, uh, he kind of just steers us in the right direction, but never like tells us what to do. Um, and him and his brother were like the two best ball hockey players probably on this planet. Um, and many people say that about them. And, you know, it was great to go out and watch them play. I think they play ball hockey in the summer. So, like, they do the Team Canada thing. And I know they played in Toronto one year and they won. So we all got to watch them. But most of the time they would go to, like, Europe and all these places. And we'd have to watch online at, like, 2 a.m. just to see my dad play. But um, him and his brother were great. And he's still playing. I think my dad's, like, 50 50- Maybe he doesn't want me to say his age online, but he's like 24. He's, he's right? up there <laughs> and he's still playing to this day, which I honestly have no idea how because my body would be broken. But he's still going and um, he's like probably the role model that many people need in their lives. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, how incredible to be able to have that as your dad. Yeah, exactly. Uh, is there anything that he does that allows him to play for this extended period of time? Like, does he sit in a sauna? Does he stretch? Does he eat well? Um, avoid alcohol? He, he doesn't drink. Oh, yeah. Okay, so so we're off to a bad he start, probably yeah. wouldn't be happy that I had <laughs> that, but it's a celebration. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he honestly, he rides his bike to work every single day. Okay. Rain, snow. 30 degree weather like no matter what he is riding his bicycle to work so maybe that's Mm. a little secret thing that he does but he's like still in shape like the best shape of his life and he's up there in age so that cardiovascular health he's got it seriously he's got it (laughs) uh i i feel like that's probably some a good segue to like work ethic and i feel like he's clearly defined that for you showcase what it takes you also work a full-time job on top of your hockey career. Could you maybe explain the demand that is put on you (laughs) and the time that you have to allocate towards your full-time job and then the sport of hockey? Yeah, it's it's a little crazy. And every time I talk about it, people are kind of like, why do you do that? But um, yeah, so I start work at 5.15 to 5.45 in the morning, depends. Um, So I'm up at 4.30, then I work till 2.00 which is shorter. I only do seven and a half hours. So let's do eight, but I get out of there as soon as possible. Um, Then I go to workout from like two to four ish. And then in season, it was like, I'd have to go to my team's workout at six o'clock. So I'd have two hours in between, probably like get a little snack, take a nap, whichever one was in demand (laughs) at that day. Um, And then, so we'd have workout from six to 7.30. We'd do video with the team from like 7.30 to 8.30 then practice 8.45 to like 10. And then I'd pretty much go home, sleep, and do it all over again the next day. Crazy. So, yeah, t- I'm. this would be going on to year three. Luckily, I'm making enough money now that I can quit FedEx. But um, I'm kind of like used to it now, which sucks. But <laughs> well, it's good. I feel like you, you have to do whatever it takes to get the job done. Exactly. Quote, like, no pun intended, but like you need to be able to financially support yourself. Yeah. And prior to this contract, the pr- premier hockey federation wasn't paying women enough to do that. Meg delay, who was the second episode on the athletes podcast ever was also a Buffalo Butte mm-hmm. and she was making 5,000 bucks. Yeah. That was me. My first year too. Like that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. That's like, you know, ha- some people's paychecks on a biweekly basis. Yeah. And that's what you guys are getting paid for an entire season. Or were, at least, I should say. Can you maybe explain what it feels like to see that kind of contract compared to a $5,000 contract? Yeah, it's it's crazy, only because, like, two years ago, I was playing for five grand, still had to put in the same amount of work and effort, um, and now I'm getting paid. I can't do math in my head, but now I'm getting paid very a times. lot more, yeah, <laughs> than uh, what I was back then, and it only... Like, I just hope everyone can get paid at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I wish everyone could get paid, but obviously 
not at this moment. Um, and players, thankfully, are not getting paid five thousand dollars anymore. It's mm -hmm. now I think the minimum's at thirteen, which is still terrible. But mm -hmm. um, it's going up, and that's all we can hope for. And you know, I'm hoping that this is a minimum for people, and then we don't have to work a full time job because I know pretty much every single player does. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping it just keeps going up from there. Yeah, one of the goaltenders you mentioned in your all time starting lineup. Leah Christine Demir, Demers, sorry if I said your name wrong. She had to quit hockey to become a doctor. Yes. And like I feel like that's not infrequent for female athletes within the sport. Um, yeah, there's many athletes, many female athletes that after college just quit to either start their life, like especially her, like a doctor. I think you have to go to school for eight more years after college. So it's yeah. kind of like... <laughs> how can you play hockey for eight years and then have to go to school for eight more years? Like it's just too much. And, uh, cheers to her. She actually just gone to med school last week, Thursday. So good there job. Go. Leah. <laughs> Leah. She did just get in last week. So that's good. Um, so her dreams are coming true, even yeah. though she had to quit hockey and everything. But, um, yeah, I know many players that are quitting just to, just to start their life and, you know, get into the workforce and everything. How, much fun was it going to Merrimack College just outside of Boston, playing the sport that you love? I know you touched on that college life, but like coming from Brampton, Toronto, Ontario, going down, crossing that 49th parallel and playing NCAA is a dream for a lot of Canadian youth yeah. growing up. Can you explain what that was like for yourself and kind of the emotions that came forward from it? Yeah, it was it was honestly pretty awesome. I I really wanted to get away from here, uh, just because I just wanted to like be alone for a little bit of time, and I think that really pushed me to play even harder, just so I could make it to mm. um, any school in the state. Really, is what I was looking forward to. And when I visited Merrimack, it was like I fell in love right away. The school is like so small, five minute walk you can get anywhere. Nice. Um, and I'm not a walker, so I <laughs> love that. Uh, so it was great. And just being there with the goalie, Leah, and my other friend, Chloe, we just had the best time ever. And even though we didn't win many games <laughs> and we were probably in last place most of the time, it was still like a great, great four years and I wouldn't change anything. I, I wasn't going to bring up the wins and losses. <laughs> I was just going to avoid that subject altogether. Focus on the 117 points he scored. Yeah. But, uh, Okay, you said you're not a walker. What's your preferred method of travel? Like, are you a runner? Oh, Monica's God. not a, Monica, who we had on a couple of episodes ago, was not a runner. So, like, I always like to clarify, like, you know. No, no, I'm a walker, but it's like if we have practice at 8 a.m., I'm getting up at like 7 45 mm. and I need to get there for 7 50 to get dressed to be on the ice by 8. So, so what I'm hearing from this is that <laughs> you're not an early riser. No, I'm an early riser. I just like my sleep. Oh, okay. Like okay. I just, I feel like, why do you have to be there at seven thirty? What am I doing for half an hour? Right. Like, I can just like get there right away, get on the ice, and yeah, get going. Yeah, you're like, it takes me two minutes to get my gear on. Why would it I? Really, it why really would does. I come three? <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Um, that brings me to like an interesting point. Like, college, four years down there, you're playing with a variety of girls, probably all across the country, North America for that matter. Any like specific traits that some girls brought to the table that it was like oh i've never seen girls play hockey like this or like the coaching staff anything particular that they brought that was unique that you had never seen coming from canada um no not really only because they were either all americans and i've played with americans before mm -hmm. and there were two girls from czech republic but they had played in canada like okay. they were at some prep school in canada so it was really like i knew it all from what they were doing it would just be probably like different languages like mm. uh my friend leah spoke french and so did a couple of other girls and then obviously the czech republic girls spoke czech so yeah. you can tell like there'd be times in the locker room where they would just like start talking and you would like turn around and be like oh okay that's not to me because it's in a different language like right. that'd be the only thing that's different other than that it was kind of all the same Yo, uh, Bucky, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> where, where does the nickname Bucky come from? I'm curious. It's probably a story that, you know, you've said isn't super glamorous, but, you know, <laughs> love to hear it. Yes, you know, it's not the best story, but when I was younger with my twin brother, when we first started skating, um, I was the youngest of three, so I would get all the handy downs, not the best equipment. My mm -hmm. dad would never buy me new things because 
I was the girl and the youngest. So I had to wear my dad's old helmet, which was a Jofa helmet. Nice. And Timu yeah, exactly. Solani. So like, you know what a Jofa <laughs> helmet looks like. Yeah. And it's not the nicest thing. So like the first day I put it on, my twin brother was like, oh, you have a Bucky helmet. Uh, and literally from four years old till now, like everyone calls me Bucky in the hockey world. Like there was guys that I played with when I was 10 that still call me Bucky because like they literally just don't know my name's Michaela half the time. So it's it's a cool nickname. I don't mind it, but it's like crazy where it came from. Yeah, that is wild. Yeah. We, we might have to get a picture of you. Yeah, in you definitely got to put a picture like beside yeah, my head right or something. Right in the YouTube. <laughs> uh, Jordan, make a note in the show notes there. Yeah, there you go. Oh, boy. Um, Anything that you would change other than wearing a Jofa <laughs> bucket at four years old? Like, I, I always like to ask, like, now that you're in professional sport, this is your third year playing professionally. Anything that you would go back and be like, oh, I wish, you know, at 10 years old or at 15 years old, I knew this about training or this about nutrition, school, whatever it is. Um, yeah, I would think when I was younger, like playing with my twin, I didn't really know much about like women's hockey or even like going to college and getting a scholarship and all that. So I kind of was just doing it for fun. Okay. So I didn't really like I did do extra work just to be better than my twin, but I didn't do work to like be the best. Mm. So that would be the only thing like I would want to pretty much focus more on hockey. Like I did play other sports, so that took up a lot of time as well. But um, just to focus more on hockey because I kind of just was going with the flow and like I knew I wouldn't be as good as my twin, but I tried to be like close to him, but I wasn't like really pushing myself when I was younger. Okay. And I think if I knew that back then about like women's hockey and everything, I, well, I think I made it pretty far, <laughs> but like maybe I could have been a little better now or something, but okay. um, that'd be the only thing I would change from when I was younger. Interesting. What, uh, what specifically would you have gone and done? Like f to me, I'm like, uh, all I'm seeing here is this <laughs> incredible 23 year old who's making good money now yeah. playing the sport. Like <clears throat> it's interesting. Like who, it, I think it probably comes down to not maybe necessarily having those people that were 20 years ago when you were growing up yeah. as people to inspire you. Right. Like I know you mentioned Angela James, um, digit Murphy as the people who were, you know, you'd love to have on your all time hockey starting lineup, but yeah. You know, were there people who you looked up to growing up that were like, hey, I, I think I could do this and like I could emulate what they're doing? Um, I try. It's weird. I don't didn't really like look up to anybody and I didn't really try to mock my game. I'd like pick things from each player and be like, oh, maybe I can do this and like try and practice it, see if I can do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't really like compare myself to anybody or try to like be like somebody which maybe was the problem. But uh, it, it's uh, I think <laughs> you're doing all right. Like exactly. <laughs> But yeah, no, like I didn't really work out much. Like I did extra with my dad, but it was kind of just like all like running and like body weight stuff. Whereas I feel like many other girls were like already training before mm. they went into college. And I basically started training when I got to college. Wow. So that would be like the only thing that I, I think I missed out on. Okay. But I was playing so many other sports that I, I felt like I didn't have to do any training because of that. But there's like so many other things that you have to do to like strengthen your body for hockey. You, you probably developed the, all of those other skills while you were playing those other sports. Exactly. And yeah. Like, that probably benefited you more than you know or realized. Yeah. At this point. <laughs> like what other sports were you playing? Um, so I played basketball. Okay. Point in guard? high school. Yep. Nice. I didn't have the best shot, but you know, I know how to move the ball You're around. Addition. Yeah, You're all about exactly. the apples. That's okay. Uh, then I would do cross country, volleyball, I don't even know what other sports are there. <laughs> I think that's it. That's okay. Running. That's yeah. A, yeah. Hey, that's a good amount yeah. on top of your other <laughs> and responsibilities. Hockey. Yeah. And I think like, you know, that's, that's important. Like, and it's interesting that you bring up that you wish you kind of had focused on hockey earlier, because I think whether it's cross country, basketball, running, whatever it is, like those sports and those skills that you acquire pay dividends in the long run because i think nowadays like kids are starting at three four five years old playing hockey playing whatever sport specializing super early and then when they get to 15 20 years old they're so overdeveloped oh yeah like, even just on a muscular level on one side because they're always taking slap shots yeah. this way yeah and like maybe they don't have a body that's going to last another 10 years once you get to the professional level so 
I don't know. I I think you might be being a little hard on yourself, but no, no, you're definitely right about it. Like I always take a month off every single year, no matter if it was like coming back from college or like ending when I was younger. Like I'd always take a month off because I was like, I actually need a month to do absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. And I actually just came back from that month off and I started working out last week and I've like the sorest I've ever been. Oh, really? Like I could barely walk. Like for FedEx, I pretty much have to walk all day and mm-hmm. I'm like walking like I'm a grandma and like everyone's like, are you okay? Like, are you injured? I'm like, nope, just sore. Like just gotta keep going. And, but I tell everyone, like even there's kids that like are literally on the ice every single day throughout the entire summer, just like working and like skating. And I'm like, you know, you guys can take a break, right? Mm-hmm. Like, There's no more school. Just like go outside, have some fun, like do something else. But they just, I feel like now it's all the parents are just like, hockey 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 when there's so many other things you can do that will probably like bring you further in hockey as well for sure yeah and I think it's not only developing from an athletic standpoint but also just like as a human being and I think that's going to develop you as an athlete as well because you're understanding you're more thoughtful you're going to think about how your decisions impact other people maybe not on the ice directly correlated but over time, all these things add up and snowball and being a good teammate and, you know, participating with other individuals on your team. Like you don't know how to necessarily do that if you've only played hockey your entire life. Yeah. Whereas in basketball, you know that, you know, you've got four other people on the court, same as hockey, that you've got to be cognizant of what the coach is saying, what those other players are saying. Yeah. yeah. All those things play into account. And I I, I don't know, to me, I'm like, I'm always fascinated when we have multi-sport athletes who then specialize. I think that's the the cherry on top because you need to have that baseline, the hand-eye coordination that you build from playing all these other sports. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) I'm sure you played a bit of ball hockey with your dad. Oh, right. Yeah. I did forget about (laughs) that sport. I was going to say, I was like, I got to bring that in. He's probably going to be mad about the champagne. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, I did play. I pretty much played my entire life. Uh, That was like our summer hockey was ball hockey. And every year I'd play with the guys and, you know, I played, pretty much all the way up until high school. And then there was one tournament we were in and my dad sat me one game. And like, I know I'm not good. Like I know I shouldn't be playing with the guys, Mm. but every year he's like, Oh, you're coming to play. You're coming to play. So I said, okay, I'm coming to play. (laughs) And then when he sat me that yet one year, I'm like, I'm done. Obviously there's no use to (laughs) me anymore. Like see you later. And I just, from that day, like I've never played since then. And it's just, I'm like, well, my my prime is over. It's time for the other guys to take over. So wow. I just he never dropped you. Yep, just like that. Yep, crazy. Should have <laughs> got that contract written. Signed yeah. to dads, they'll do that to you. Hey? Seriously. <laughs> um, I think you're also paving the way for females in this sport, not just hockey, but females in general participating in sports and making it a bigger deal. Because I think. For so long, there's been inequality, just male-dominated vertical. And unfortunately, like, we're at a point now, fortunately, we're at a point now where people are pushing to make this more prominent. And, you know, we have ESPN now. I think it's crazy, like, only 10% is female sports, but at least that number's grown from 5% or whatever it was prior. You're also participating in the Society for Equity in Sport um, that's doing the Halifax Hockey Summit featuring yourself, George LaRock, Anson Carter, and Jill Sonier. Sonier? Sonier? I think so. Jill Sonier. Yeah. Sorry if I'm <laughs> saying that wrong. Um, but you're, you're inspiring positive change through these dis- difficult conversations. And I'd love for you to maybe elaborate on kind of what's happening at that event, how people can maybe explore, be a part of, contribute to. Yeah, so I honestly don't know very much about it, but I know that us four will be on a panel just basically talking about our experiences in hockey and obviously um, like how different it was or especially because of the two guys that are there and the two women like how different it is growing up in hockey and playing obviously they played in Halifax I'm here so it might have been a little bit different over there than it was here and then you know we're talking about how like things can change basically the Halifax um city is trying to change their protocol so then we'll be talking about like different things on what they should put in place and what they should take out what should they change and all that um is basically what will be going on there and then we're running a hockey clinic because there is there's a bunch of girls younger girls that I know that play hockey 
um, in Halifax, but don't really get the opportunity to go anywhere because it's Halifax. It's not the biggest place. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're just trying to show that even though you're from Halifax, you can still go a far way yeah. and just bringing me in and bringing everyone else in to, to show like younger girls and even younger boys that they can make it no matter where they are. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's an important topic to touch on. What did you face growing up? I'm sure there was some tremendous battles that you had to go through despite your brother being there along yeah. the side, <laughs> part of that journey. Like, what were some of the obstacles that you had to face? I'd love for you to just share whatever you're comfortable sharing as far as how you were able to get through that and now be where you are today. Yeah, so really the only, um, in guys hockey, what I faced a lot was, like, I was a girl obviously trying to play a male sport, and I kind of got pushed back. Like, I would never make the AAA team because they didn't want a girl on their team. And I'd always pull my brother back to AA because we had to stay together. You wouldn't split us up. Um, so that was like the kind of the only downfall was I was kind of pulling my brother back and everyone was kind of just not liking women being in their sport. I was probably the only girl at that point, like playing hockey. So that kind of sucked back then, but it came to a point where I told my dad, like, just let my brother, like, I know he's good enough to play there. Just let him be. And like, I'll play a or whatever and just you know do my thing like I'm not here to like really be that competitive and obviously he is and he wants to go far um so it got to a point where we did split up for a year but then we came back together because it was kind of just crazy for my parents yeah um and then when I switched over to girls hockey just being obviously a black person playing the sport um I only had like one incident where this this girl told me to go back and play basketball Wow. And like in the moment, it was like a scrum around the net. And in the moment, I was like, I don't play basketball. <laughs> like that was my response yeah. back. But like it was my teammates that brought it up to my coach and was like, oh, like the girl said this to, to Bucky on the ice. And from there, it like got brought up to like their team and like all the way up the, the chain and everything. But like I had no idea hmm. that like what she was trying to get at from that. And it was my teammates that kind of like pointed it out. So I guess I'm glad they were around because I kind of was like not really known to it because I feel like the people I surround myself with like my entire life was just mainly like people uh, like white people. So I didn't really see any of like the racial stuff happening much. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess I'm lucky in that way. I know many people have faced many things playing hockey and it's still going on to this day, which is kind of crazy. But um, Mm -hmm. Hopefully, it will change in the coming years. Yeah. Uh, that's have all you, I can hope for. Have you seen uh, what the Hockey Diversity Alliance has been doing? Like, Akeem L.U. with his uh, comic book that just came Comic book. Yeah. His book that just came out. I'm assuming. It's a caricature book, I believe. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, yeah. But, like, they're doing a ton of work there. Have you been kind of seeing that involved in any way? Um, no, I haven't been involved with it in any way, mainly because I'm not, like, really much of a a speaker and I kind of like to do things on the down low not be like too in it anyway so this is like the top for you you're like yeah, I don't want to do anything. I'm like this. podcast sure put me in front of like a huge tv no thank you uh, okay um I kind of like be the the back girl and everything um but yeah I think they're doing great things there and you know even though they're trying their hardest to like change make change like things are still happening like the stuff with Nazem Kadri it's like where is it going to change and when is it going to change? But you can only do so much until, you know, people start changing how they think and stuff. Yeah. It's so unfortunate to have that occurring to a guy like Naz who's played a long time in the (laughs) NHL and continues to face this. I know his wife shared that post and that's something that's Mm. like, that's not just new to this postseason because of being involved with that Jordan Bennington incident. Like, this is something he's faced along his entire career. And it's terrible just to think that people have to go through that on top of all the other difficulties that come with being a professional athlete and having yeah. to work crazy hours and travel ridiculous times. Yeah. Like you throw in the idea of discrimination and being racist or facing racism. Like is what can people do to maybe start having those conversations to maybe educate themselves or those around them. Is there anything that you've suggested or seen done that's been very empowering or allowed people to 
have a new point of view or different perspective? Yeah. You know, I feel like it's just, it's just talking and being open. Like I'm kind of an open book. You can ask me anything. I'll answer your questions. And I feel like many people are. And if you ask about like our hard times and things like that, um, like I'm sure everyone will share their story and be able to open up to you. Um, and it's kind of just switching how you think. Like I know, um, my roommate Leah, like read a book and I should know the name of the book, but I don't know the name of the book. Um, and she literally called me after and she's like, holy crap, like I never knew, like this is what you could be going through every single day. Like it didn't even cross my mind because of like basically how I act. I act like nothing gets to me, which nothing really does. Like I kind of just brush it under. I'm like, oh, okay, you know what? Like mm. if that makes you feel better, congratulations. But like I just kind of just continue on my path where there are some people that are like, no, like that's absolutely wrong and they're going to fight back against it. Mm. And that's my twin brother in a nutshell. <laughs> um, but yeah, it just depends on like how open people are talking about it. And I think if everyone just stays quiet and doesn't say anything, it's really not going to go anywhere. Um, so it just, and it's not even people of color. It's like everyone needs to start talking about it, not just the people that are getting the hate and stuff. For sure. Yeah. Um, you talked about like enjoying your youth in a, other podcasts that you did um i believe it was involved with the toronto six but and like you specifically said not getting catty when you're young air quotes around it but like i think it's important we try and educate entertain and inspire that next generation of athletes and i think your your point that you made on that podcast was interesting and in how you know appreciating your youth is so important and yeah. i'd love for you to maybe unwrap the onion a bit more there and dive into what exactly you meant by that um, if I'm being honest, I don't remember what I said, but just thinking like, we're like 23, I'm not sure how old you are, but like I'm 23 now and I look back and I'm like, wow, like there's so many things I wish I'd done when I was younger just because now I know that it's all work, work, work from here on out. Like mm. I will have to work every single day of my life to make money, to pay bills, to do things that I want to do. Like I want to travel and to travel, you need money money comes from working so there's so many things they have to do now whereas when you were younger it's kind of all on your parents and you could have done whatever you wanted and I think like sometimes I was so focused on hockey so focused on sports that I kind of like missed my childhood like I can say I don't really have any friends from high school because I distanced myself because they were going in one way and I want to go another way mm. and I kind of had to focus so much on like school getting my grades up and hockey and all that that I kind of missed out on like my high school life whereas people other people had like probably different experiences in high school mm -hmm. um and I just say like enjoy it while you're young because once you hit the age once you get to college it's like it's sweet for four years and then it <laughs> many people say it's an upward it's going up but it really goes downhill after that because then you have so many things that are put on you that you kind of have to figure out and it's like it sucks but I just hope many people when they're younger just take that and, you know, enjoy their, just enjoy the youth because it, you only get it once <laughs> and you can't go back. <laughs> it's so true. Like, I, I can't remember, I, Jordan Syatt, who we had on a couple episodes ago, talked and basically said that university is a vacation for those four years. Yep. And it doesn't seem like it in the moment because you're just getting out of high school. You're like, oh, I got another four years of school. Yeah. <laughs> like. I got to study, I got to submit reports, whatever, but it is a vacation like yeah. through and through, unless you're becoming a doctor or a lawyer, like those are two pretty intense yeah. programs outside of that. You probably have the most free time you will ever have yep. in your entire life. Yep. So like you said, take advantage of it, <laughs> enjoy it, especially in high school. Like, man, like it's, we don't realize it when you're young going through it and then, yeah. like I said, you go through the next step, university, college take advantage of that time i could not agree with you more because you know i look back i'm like there, there is a lot of time there i could have been. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> but you also talked about like where you were coming in and you saw like oh, i wish i had done some more training before going into university what does your training look like now like i know you take that month off are you spending hours in the gym are you trying to diversify go on the ice play ball hockey like what does it look like nowadays? Yeah, you, you know, ball hockey's off the plate. <laughs> <laughs> Completely done. Eh? Like I said, I'm not much of a runner. I don't <laughs> like running. I don't like walking as much. So anything that has to do with that, it's kind of kicked to the curb. Okay. 
Um, but I'm working out five days a week, pretty much for two hours. That's how long it was today. So it's pretty much two hours all summer. I actually did that all year. Wow. For the basically for the past three years, I've just been working out every single day. Yeah. Um, and then we'd do team stuff. But since it's summertime, I would just do my workouts, and then I would get in a lot of steps at work. So that's yeah. like a workout, but a little lower than my workouts. And then from there, it's just enjoying my free time. Like I would go golf, which is nice. technically like another workout on yeah, top of my sure workouts. Um, What's the handicap? Everyone always asks that. I mean, I just played at, I don't even know the place called, but I just played somewhere and I got 71. No, no, no. But that course was like a par three. So it was six, oh. 61 was the, the par the par yeah and i got 71 so i was like okay oh, i was gonna say if you shot I'm one under <laughs> if you shot one under i was like man we need to have you on the pod for something else yeah. <laughs> hey that's still phenomenal when did yeah. you start playing golf i started basically during covid like me and my dad were like we need something to do and Sick. i feel like golf was the only thing that was open for sure so i went i bought like clubs for 1500 bucks and i'm like oh. i am going to use them as much as possible because nice. i paid too much for them the, uh, yeah, golf has actually just increased crazy amounts over yeah. the past couple of years. Thanks. It, Cause it was dying prior to COVID. So COVID actually revived it. It really did. It was something to do during, even though Ontario shut it down for a couple months, which was like the craziest yeah. thing in the world. Yeah. I don't even want to get started on that. <laughs> um, but yeah, nonetheless, that's awesome that you picked up the sport of golf because that's something that you can play for your entire life. Yeah. And obviously something you share with your dad. So that's a cool thing to be able to do. Does your yeah. brother play it as well? Um, he comes out with us, but we're not fans when he comes out because it takes too long. Oh, he <laughs> He's not the best player. So, <laughs> okay. you know, we're, we're searching for his balls a little bit too much sometimes. <laughs> so he gets kicked to the curb for that one. Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. Hey, well, I feel like he had his prime playing hockey so he now did you're like, he did hey you gotta pay your dues right? yeah it's my turn now <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome um where does it go from here because you now sign this huge contract for women's hockey playing with the buffalo buttes i know you are excited about the opportunity to go down and play there starting late august september sometime but over the next you know, three months. I know your phone's been blowing up nonstop, <laughs> receiving calls from reporters trying to do stuff like this where they're chatting about your experience. But for you, I imagine you have some still crazy ambitions and yeah. some goals that you'd like to achieve. Do you want to give us some insight, shine some light on what some of those goals are? And maybe when we have this conversation in a couple of years from now, <laughs> again, following up, we can check those off the list. Yeah. So, you know, I want to, I think everyone's dream is to to play for Team Canada, play for your country. And I think that's something that I'm still striving for now. And, you know, I'm putting in the work and I'm doing extra because of the big signing. Everyone keeps telling me that I now need to perform better than I ever had. Mm -hmm. So with that coming into my head, it's like, okay, so I keep working out, going on the ice, doing what I got to do. Hopefully we'll get better to be the best player next year and then hopefully get a look from Team Canada, try out whatever it's called, whatever I have to do to get there. Um, that's kind of like my big hockey goal, but for just like regular life, like I do have to go back to school, unfortunately, mm. to get my master's, um, in psychology to do what I want there. So there's many things that I have to do and, you know, hockey's kind of taking <laughs> the priority right now, but, um, hopefully we'll get back to, to school, but yeah, you gotta, <laughs> hey, you gotta delay that a little bit. Keep yeah, playing exactly. hockey when you can, you know, exactly. like you said, you're only, the age that you are now now and yeah exactly you got to take advantage of that youth and being able to play um it's interesting because you play two years with the toronto six you light it up on yeah. a scoreboard mvp in 2021 for the nwhl now phf why is it that you haven't gotten those looks from team canada and i know i'm probably <laughs> putting you on the spot here but like maybe i'm putting some pressure on hockey canada to be <laughs> like yo let's get some eyes on michaela yeah, you know, it's, I think it's a question many people have, and unfortunately, I do not have the answer, and I have no idea why, but sometimes with, like, Hockey Canada and all that, if you're not in the program from when you're 16, which I did say wasn't the best player back then, mm -hmm. uh, you're kind of just never getting into it, so hopefully I can break that, because it's either you get in then, 
get in your first year of college or you're kind of just out of it. Um, so hopefully I can break that I think pattern in the next couple of years. But, uh, you know, I'll try my best, but there's, that's all I can do. I think this is going to do it. Like I, I firmly believe that, you know, this conversation, what you've been able to do over these past couple of months, few years, honestly, between Merrimack and Toronto six and WHL PHF, like, there's no way they can ignore you anymore yeah. at this point. And like, I, I hope that someone from hockey Canada is yeah. watching this and like, yo, we need to actually put her on the team because you deserve it. Like yeah. points you. wise, <laughs> performance wise. Like I was watching highlights. I didn't play hockey at the NHL level, but I can damn sure identify a good hockey player. Yeah. And I think the fact that you haven't been given that opportunity is a real shame. And I wanted to use this as an opportunity to say, Hey, if you're watching from Hockey Canada, <laughs> at least get like I, I man, you I you can't tell me that that you don't deserve that opportunity. And I it's frustrating for me when I see people who are overlooked at any level, especially when it's someone who's put in the hard work and had the dedication that you have over the past decade to not be the best player, not yeah. get that hockey Canada invite at sixteen, and still now, you know, fast forward eight years later be the highest paid player like it's just mind-boggling so (laughs) anyway I wanted to go on a little rant there for uh, 30 seconds a minute but you know that that is something that I wanted to bring up and make sure that you like you know in your mind that you deserve it and it's just a matter of them figuring out on the back end when that next opportunity comes because I think (laughs) it'll happen yes thank you and I do many people have told me this and many people have said like I should be there but I mean the people telling me that are not Team Canada people, so they're, they'll come around. They'll come around. Hopefully, that's that's the plan. Yeah, exactly. And it, you know what? This is like why it's important to do these kind of things and have these conversations because I think when people understand the reality of the situation is that at the end of the day, Hockey Canada needs to put the best team yep. on the ice, and I think you belong in that category. So that's the end of my rant. Thanks for coming <laughs> to my TED Talk. Um, Michaela, the way we wrap up every episode on the Athletes Podcast is we ask our guests what their biggest piece of advice would be. We've touched on it briefly, but I just wanted to say thank you, first of all, for coming in, s- spending time chatting with us today. It's it's an honor to be able to have this conversation, <laughs> and I'm excited to be able to do it in the future, continue following along your career. But I'd love for you to take this opportunity to leave the audience, those watching on YouTube, listening, wherever they're consuming the AP content (laughs) with your biggest piece of advice to that next gen. Um, yeah. And I totally had it in my brain, but my brain is shutting off. It's It's, it's it's getting close uh, to six o'clock. It's almost my bedtime, but I think I would just say, you know, like to never give up. I mean, like you said, I've been overlooked basically my entire life where it's team Canada, team Ontario, even my dad's ball hockey team. (laughs) Like I've been overlooked so many times that I would just tell people to like never give up. If you have a dream or an aspiration to make it somewhere, just, you know, continue on working and doing what you need to do to get there. And I had a dream to go to college. I went to college, did my best, had a dream to play pro hockey and I'm here now. And my next dream hopefully is to make team Canada. So I'm just putting in as much work as possible to get myself there and just don't give up even if people bring you down in any way um just keep pushing incredible words Michaela thank you so much for coming on the athletes podcast thank you for having me I really appreciate it where can people find you on social media so that when you make team Canada (laughs) they can follow retweet give you that support that you deserve yes um I believe my Instagram is just my last name Grant Mentis no hyphen and so is my Twitter And that's all I have. So Perfect. (laughs) Perfect. Awesome. Well, we thank you guys for tuning in, listening to the Athletes Podcast. Bye. See ya. Thank you folks for tuning into the 127th episode of the Athletes Podcast featuring Michaela Grant Mentis. Big shout out to her for coming here to the studio live in Toronto to record the episode. These conversations are so much better when we're able to do them in person. Thank you to you for coming on, listening, consuming the AP content wherever you are. We appreciate it. Please be sure to hit that subscribe button. It's going to allow us to do this for many more years to come. Hope you enjoyed the show. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.